It was Christmas, 1999. My Uncle Bill brought over a mysterious DVD, a movie called The Matrix. I had very little idea what the movie had in store for us. I just knew that after we were done opening presents and eating dinner, we were going to find out. I had only seen one TV commercial and an ad in the newspaper earlier that year. Well, I also remember leafing through a magazine at my local library called Starlog, where it covered the making of the film, but I didn't give it too much thought at that time. I just thought it looked cool. When we popped in the disc and we were greeted by the menu page, I felt this sense of excitement that was hard to suppress. It didn't hurt that we had a surround system set up that made the walls shake. I know this is the kind of movie you should see on the biggest screen possible, but there was something special about having your family around for the holidays and watching a movie that you knew very little about. And then it started. And oh, was it glorious. So sit back, relax, grab a juicy digital steak, and come back with me to 1999 when The Matrix blew our mind. As the movie progressed, I got sucked into the Matrix just like Neo. It starts with the sleek avatar of Trinity as she makes her escape from the movie's villains, led by Agent Smith. Then it happened, the bullet time sequence. I had never seen anything like it. The way Trinity leapt into the air, time freezing, kick forming, and I knew. This movie was special. She evades the agents as they chase her from the rooftops, through a window, down some stairs, and right through a phone booth. But not before she narrowly escapes back to the real world. Okay, pause right there. The bullet time effect. Brilliant. A total innovation that had never been seen before. Or so I thought. The invention of bullet time stretches all the way back to 1985, when a primitive version of it was used for the band Accept and their music video Midnight Mover. It was done with 13 cameras mounted close together going in a circle around the band. It was then used in the music video for the Rolling Stones song, Like a Rolling Stone. However, it started to look more like the technique used in The Matrix when filmmaker Michel Gondry applied it to his Smirnoff commercial. In it, his main character freezes in midair while avoiding a bullet. It was also used for this Gap commercial and in Lost in Space, which came out in 1998. Listen, friends, my mind was blown when I found out that there had been examples of this technique before The Matrix came out. But it was The Matrix that innovated the technique way beyond its previous uses. We'll get into that a little later. Anyway, Neo wakes up, a lonely hacker by night, a depressed corporate drone by day. He gets a message from his computer. Wake up, Neo. The Matrix has you. Follow the white rabbit. Then he's interrupted by a knock at his door. After he hands off a piece of shady software to a client, he's invited to go to a club. Once he sees the white rabbit, he knows he has to investigate. He meets Trinity, who lets him know that the answer to the questions he has night after night, what is the Matrix, is out there, and it will find him. Then he wakes up, late for work. After getting reprimanded by his boss, he's hunted down by agents who take him to an interrogation room. Things get really crazy when Neo's mouth fuses shut and Agent Smith uses a weird robotic insect thing to burrow into Neo's belly button. Bam! It was all a dream! Or was it? After getting a personal call from the mysterious Morpheus, Neo gets picked up by Trinity, Switch, and Apoc. Trinity violently sucks the tracing bug out of Neo's belly with this gnarly vacuum contraption. Now he knows he's in over his head. He meets Morpheus, who gives him a chance to take a blue pill and wake up thinking this was all just a dream, or take the red pill and find out everything. Neo takes the red pill, and now he's on his way to the real world. He wakes up in a mechanical womb that's been holding his frail body for his whole life. He's flushed out of it like a toilet and then picked up by the Nebuchadnezzar. This sends him on a journey of learning, training, and self-realization. He must take the hero's journey and find out if he really is the one. When I was younger, the scenes that came to mind when I thought of The Matrix was this scene, this scene, this scene, and this scene. It was all about the outer layer of this movie when I was 12. The kung fu, the special effects, the sunglasses, this phone. I still think that phone is awesome, by the way. At school, I would reenact the bullet time scene with my friends. I was limber enough to come pretty close, actually. I wouldn't try it today, though, not without wires, at least. During wrestling practice, I would run along the padded walls like Trinity did in the movie. 
It's the kind of film that pulls in a wide audience because of its amazingly unique way of telling the story. Now that I'm 35 years old, I'm most attracted to this scene, this scene, and this scene. Why? Well, I guess I'm just fascinated by the idea that the world around us isn't what it seems. That we are all encouraged to accept everything at face value, to do as we're told by our leaders and influencers on social media. It obviously hits harder in 2023 than it did in 1999 because back then, social media and the instant gratification of the online world didn't really exist. We still had dial-up modems, people. As I matured into an adult though, I found myself questioning reality on a daily basis. Why does the world work the way it does? Who really runs it? Is the information that we get from our media trustworthy? Why does society do the things it does? Is it because there's a force that guides us in that direction? Or is it all just random? I've felt like Neo before, half asleep in life, looking for answers and feeling like I'd never find them, looking through my computer and TV screen to see if I could spot clues to what life is all about. Wouldn't it be great if we could be shown the truth like Neo was? If we could all have our own Morpheus guiding us to the truth? I think there's an element of wish fulfillment to the Matrix that touches us deep in our hearts. Religions of all kinds can relate to this film. When this movie came out, I don't think people had really thought of the world in terms of simulation, though. It was sort of an alien concept to the masses. These days, the simulation theory has been popularized by Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, and even Elon Musk. But back then, it was just the plot of a badass science fiction movie with Keanu Reeves and Kung Fu in it. Great art is something that makes us think while still being entertaining. Larry and Andy Wachowski, now known as Lana and Lily, understood this, and it was their passion of philosophy, Hong Kong action movies, comic books, and thought-provoking anime that helped them tell their masterpiece. Their prior work in comic books also helped them convince Warner Brothers to trust them with a $63 million budget. You have to understand, The Matrix was part of a three-picture deal that included scripts for Assassins, Bound, and The Matrix. All of these were written by the Wachowskis. The Matrix was the third of these, and the second to be directed by them. It was suggested by the Matrix producer, Joel Silver, that the siblings direct the movie Bound first to gain credibility with the studio. Bound starred Jennifer Tilly, Gina Gershon, and Joe Pantoliano. It's a 1996 film about a tough ex-con named Corky and her sweetheart Violet who devise a plan to steal millions of dollars in hidden mob money and blame it on Violet's shady boyfriend, Caesar. It was also the Wachowskis' first time working with the likable Pantoliano. Anyway, back to their comic book roots. They had been writers on a comic book series called Ecto Kid, created by Clive Barker. Ecto Kid is about Dexter Mungo, a 14-year-old boy whose father is a ghost. Dex, as he is known, sees the world normally with his right eye, but with his left, he can see into the ectosphere, a dimension almost identical to Earth, but it's populated by creatures and races out of myths, legends, and nightmares. You can see the siblings' fascination with characters that have a foot in one reality as well as another. Even though the studio was impressed with the Wachowskis' writing and directing abilities, and they knew that the Matrix script was intriguing, they were still confused by it. To help Warner Brothers understand their vision better, the Wachowskis hired the comic book artists Jeff Darrow and Steve Skros to draw a shot-for-shot -shot storyboard of the movie. The Wachowskis posed and acted out every frame that was drawn so that the artists could fully capture what was in their heads. Once the studio saw these drawings, they were convinced. I'm sure you've heard this before, but just in case you haven't, Will Smith was the studio's first choice to play Neo. He turned it down and regretted it. Now, the Wachowskis wanted Johnny Depp for the role, but Warner Brothers countered with the suggestion of Keanu Reeves. Reeves was ultimately the best choice for the role. He's the one that took it most seriously and had the most passion for it. You might as well call his earlier outing in the cyberpunk movie Johnny Mnemonic a warm-up to The Matrix. The siblings made sure that the entire main cast of the film be fully read up on the books Simulacra and Simulation and Kevin Kelly's Out of Control. Simulacra and Simulation is about how signs of culture and media create the reality we perceive. Out of Control is about the evolution of technology and how our relationship to it will affect us and the world. Impressively, Reeves was able to have a fully functional conversation on the philosophies of both books before reading the script. 
I mean, the cast of The Matrix was perfect. Keanu, Carrie Ann Moss, Lawrence Fishburne, and Hugo Weaving seemed like they were the characters they were playing, and they all had great chemistry together. And I think that's because they all had to train rigorously as a group for the extensive Hong Kong-style martial arts sequences. They did this four months before filming even began, and before that, the stunt coordinator, Yoon Woo Ping, and his team pre-planned and filmed the stunts the actors would be doing. Wu Ping also tailored the fighting style of each actor based on their individual strengths. Reeves' perfection, Fishburne's persistence, Weaving's robotic precision, and Moss's feminine grace. In that time, the actors, the stunt team, and all the filmmakers grew closer together like a family. Chemistry is so important to movies. It's something that radiates through the screen and out into the audience. It's something we can feel, and it's hard to fake. I think that's what sets the Matrix cast apart their dedication. Keanu Reeves was in the process of healing from neck surgery while training for the film. Before his surgery, he was having pain and a numb, tingling sensation in his neck. He was also starting to lose his balance. He didn't want the Wachowskis to know about this, fearing that he would lose out on the role of a lifetime. During his surgery, the doctors put a plate in his spine, and they advised that he start moving as soon as possible to get the neck used to it. So the stunt crew started him off gently. He couldn't do the crazier stunt work until later in the filming schedule. This movie made Keanu an action icon. He may not have been the first choice for the role, but he deserved it the most. I mean, would you do intense training in martial arts for four months while healing from neck surgery, shave your whole body, including your eyebrows that might not grow back, and lose 15 pounds for a role? You could say yes, but would you do it well? The dude even requested training from the stunt team on days off so that he could perfect his choreography. Any stunts he couldn't perform due to danger or impossibility due to his neck, he had his stunt double Chad Stahelski perform. Chad would go on to direct all four of the John Wick films with Keanu starting in 2014. In fact, I gotta read you this quote that Chad gave to Sci-Fi.com. It sums up the once-in-a-lifetime expectation that the Wachowskis had for everyone involved in front of the camera. Creating heroes, how do you do that? The Wachowskis took a page out of the Hong Kong book and decided let's get the cast members and train the shit out of them in martial arts choreography. That takes an enormous amount of time, and wire work may look fun, but it's painful. You're in a tiny little harness and it's wrecking your hips and squeezing your other parts, so the level of endurance you have to go through every day for months, it's phenomenal. Very few people do what the Wachowskis were demanding of their cast, and the evidence of that have you seen anything that's close to The Matrix since? Honestly, no. I can't imagine Hollywood letting directors do what the Wachowskis did back then. Unless you're Christopher Nolan, but he has a track record, and the Wachowskis were basically newcomers at the time. Props to late 90s Hollywood. Hugo Weaving had to have a polyp removed from his leg early in production, which almost got him recast. But since he and Keanu both had injuries that needed healing, they scheduled their fight scenes for the last half of the film which is fortunate because Weaving is perfect as Agent Smith. Also, Carrie Ann Moss, practicing for a flip during the lobby shootout scene, twisted her ankle very badly. I mean, you can see how much it hurt. She hid how badly it felt for the rest of the production so that she wouldn't have to be replaced. The cast had an unbelievably dedicated passion to this movie. Like, they could tell it was one of the most special movies they would ever make. They protected their parts at all costs. Not only was the training a long and grueling process, so was the filming. It took 118 days to film everything. On the first day of the shoot, the cast and crew held a Buddhist ceremony to bless the production. There was a roasted pig, ceremonial candles. It was a fitting way to kick things off. The first scene filmed was the escape from the office building. Look how the directors, whenever it was needed, would act out a scene to show exactly what they were looking for. They did this throughout the entire film. I mean, look at this part where they help Carrie and Keanu understand the placement of where the Sentinels would be in this scene. It's so freaking awesome. This movie was undoubtedly one of the best prepped films in history. So much detail was put into it. The only other movie I can think of that was as prepared as this film was the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In both cases, the work paid off big time. There were so many great details like having twins cast as extras in this training sequence. This was done to emphasize that The Matrix was a computer program that would take shortcuts in its programming to save time. The Wachowskis decided to use rear projection for this car scene instead of a green screen, which would look more realistic. The rear projection gave a more synthetic feel to the background. 
This emphasized Neo's knowledge of the Matrix being fake. By the way, during the scene where Neo's mouth melts together, Keanu had to communicate with the Wachowskis by writing down his questions or comments on a piece of paper. What a crazy day on set that must have been. As an actor, how could you not have the time of your life on this film? Look at the sets. It's not like today where it's mostly green screen and you're reacting to nothing. Look at the detail and the size of these sets. This helicopter was lightweight, but full scale, with the choppers being added in during post-production. Now I want to know who got to take that home when the film wrapped. You just know that one of the producers has that in their house somewhere. This pod was full of real goo that had to be heated up because the stunt person testing it got hypothermia. It looks spectacular. Let's take a moment and give thanks to this dude. When I was a kid, the advent of DVDs fed my hunger to understand how movies were made. The Matrix, in particular, was a movie I had to know more about. In fact, when the movie was over, my family spent time going through every nook and cranny of the DVD special features. My personal favorite is the Follow the White Rabbit feature. It starts the movie from the beginning, and at certain points, a white rabbit will pop up on screen. When you click on it, it'll show you some juicy BTS footage from the scene you were just watching. There are nine white rabbits in total that pop up during the movie. Then you have a great making of documentary that was truly magical for us 1999 folk. Back then, DVDs were essential to getting a deeper dive into how a movie was made. We also got an inside look at the bullet time technique with special effects supervisor John Gaeta. He shows us the camera rig that made it possible and lets us in on how it works. Basically, it's a rig of 120 still cameras and two motion picture cameras arranged in whatever way the directors wanted. Then they create a digital background to accompany it. The filmmakers weren't sure if the technique was going to work yet, so just in case, they filmed a live version of it on set with wires, and it just didn't look as cool. Luckily, they perfected the bullet time technique, and the rest is history. The amount of parody this special effect got in the years after is just astonishing. I remember it getting annoying after a while. It eventually faded with time, though. The last scene filmed wrapped at 1.01 in the morning. Everyone was tired but excited about the hard work they had put in. Everyone knew this movie was special. The movie grossed $463 million worldwide in 1999, $467 million when you add in all the re-releases the film had through the years. I finally got to see it in an IMAX theater a couple of years later during one of these re-releases. My family and I saw it at the Chicago Navy Pier. Sadly, that IMAX theater was closed down permanently in 2021. The Matrix franchise got three sequels after the original came out. I won't talk about those here because there's a lot to cover, and I'll do that in another video. For now though, let's leave this on a rose-colored note during that Christmas of 1999, where the Matrix grabbed hold of my imagination and never let go. Hey, I'm Scotty Dunn, thanks for watching. If you dug my video, let the Matrix know by doing a triple kick to the like button. See you next time.